So this was kind of the recorded history of the Cincinnati. Um, of note in the um, Daniel Boone story was that there was a, a guy in Kentucky named John Filson. I actually wrote about this and it was in the Sunday's paper if you happen to see it or see it online. And John Filson was, uh, had a book called uh, Discovery of the Settlement of Kentucky. And he was trying to drum up interest in settlements in, in Kentucky. And he had an appendix at the end. And he had met and talked with Daniel Boone and had wrote down his um, life story. And that was the first biography of Daniel Boone, taken from Boone's own words, reportedly. And that kind of began the legend of Daniel Boone. Filson then went on to team up with a couple of guys. And I think that's the next picture. And in 1788, he teamed up with Messiah Denman, uh, James Patterson, or John Patterson, um, and Filson. And they bought some land from John Cleve Sims. And uh, Sims had bought the whole Sims purchase, the Miami purchase. And it's it like 300,000 acres in what is now Hamilton, Butler, and Warren counties. And uh, he would resell the things. And they bought some land and a, and a to start a new settlement. And there were three different settlements being founded within a month of each other. And the first one was Columbia. It was now the Columbia Tuscola area. And that was founded in November of 1788. In December of 1788 was what became Cincinnati. And in January or February of 1789 was um, North Bend that John Cleve Sims founded himself. And these, those three guys, Filson and Denham and, and Patterson, um, founded this area and they were going to do a settlement. And Filson was the surveyor. And he went and surveyed the, kind of did a cursory survey of the land and came up with a name. And his name was, you see on the top of the picture, Lusantaville. Lusantaville was a bunch of syllables from different languages that meant the city opposite the mouth of the Licking River, and the Licking River into Kentucky. Remember, there were already Kentucky settlers. Um, so it was important to have that connection into, into Kentucky. Um, unfortunately, Filson was out uh, working a survey one day and he disappeared and it's presumed that he had was killed by some of the Shawnee, um, but his body was never found, but he was presumed dead and they brought in Israel Ludlow to be the new partner and surveyor. And um, so this happened in October and in December is when they actually, so the first settlers came and set up. You see this little notch um, in the ground there by a tree. It's uh, kind of where the boats are heading towards in this picture. That is a an inlet at uh, what is now Sycamore Street. There was a sycamore tree there, and that's why it's called Sycamore Street. That, to give you a reference, is about right field of Great American Ballpark today. You see Main Street coming up the middle of the street of the uh, the settlement here, because Main Street was initially the center of the city and eventually especially with fountain square and everything uh, we kind of migrated westward and so vine street became the center of town uh so i said losantaville and the bottom it says cincinnati so it's actually cincinnati because um in the back corner you, uh, you can see a little square fort and i have a better picture of it here and that was fort washington and fort washington was uh built to be a um, help protect these new white settlers from the uh, Shawnee who would be raiding the different settlements. And uh, Losantaville was chosen amongst the three settlements because it didn't have the flooding problem. If you go back here, you can see how the Cincinnati's kind of up, raised up a little bit, that little lip. Um, and so the flooding issues weren't, weren't as severe as they were in uh, North Bend. And if you think about how often it flooded in Coney Island out there, you can see how, how uh, Columbia was. So it went to Losantaville. And um, General Arthur St. Clair was the president of the Northwest Territory. And he came in 1790 to inspect the fort, Fort Washington. And he liked the fort, but he hated the name Losantaville. So he uh, changed the name to Cincinnati, and it was named after the Society of the Cincinnati, which was a, a military kind of a fraternity group of uh, people who had been um, officers in the Revolutionary War. The president of that society was George Washington, and it was named for uh, Lucius Quintus Cincinnatus. He was a 5th century BC Roman general, and he had been called in to battle to lead them in, in battle. He won, 
and became kind of emperor, but then didn't want it. He wanted to go back to being just a private citizen, so he retired to go back to farming. And that example is what George Washington essentially did, is he could have been the new king of America, and instead he went back um, and allowed them to kind of build up the uh, democracy and stuff and be president later, but not king, which he really could have been. He was that popular and had that much power at the time. And so uh, people would refer to George Washington as a America's Cincinnatus. <laughs> so Cincinnati is, in a sense, really kind of names for George Washington, if you will. You have Fort Washington and Cincinnati. So it's, you can kind of see that connection there. So uh, a lot of the um, military expeditions against the native tribes uh, were launched from Fort Washington. Um, a lot of several defeats, in fact, but it was uh, Arthur, uh, no, no, uh, what's his name? Um, Matt Anthony Wayne, who kind of led um, the, the final battles, um, more decisive battles, I guess I, I should say, against uh, the, the Shawnee in particular. And the Treaty of Greenville happened in 1795, and that kind of settled the, you know, the Indian Wars, if you will, um, for the time. Um, so they didn't need the fort anymore, and they, and they took it down about 1800, 1802, something like that. Sorry, I have a million dates in my head. That's why I write them down. So, <laughs> so forgive me if I if I flub a little date here and there, but um, it's it's around there, 1801, 1802. Um, but where this was is kind of interesting. We saw in the in this map here. It's kind of off in that back corner. Um, to give you an idea, that's roughly third and kind of out near where uh, Lytle Park is today. But they didn't know exactly, and they had a. Um, a monument to kind of show it. But back in the 1950s, um, there was some construction being done for a new parking garage or something. And they found what was a um, an original magazine, you know, a, uh, you know, a powder magazine for the, the fort and found out that the fort was about, you know, a block or so away from where they originally thought it was. And they had to move the marker and everything. And so they had to readjust their thinking of where exactly Fort Washington was. <laughs> Um, get to 1811 here, and the first steamboats come through. And John Fulton had the first steamboat. <clears throat> came from uh, Pittsburgh, past Cincinnati, <clears throat> and uh, on the Ohio River. And that was kind of a, a, a key day because, you know, everything's built on the river. That's really where life in Cincinnati comes from. And, uh, the early, early city was really built right around, uh, you know, there were points where something built on 3rd Street was considered to be outside the city and, and too far away for anyone to bother with. You saw how far that fort was from the rest of the pictures. That's 3rd Street. Mm -hmm. And um, so not only do we have a lot of... of you know, steamboat traffic and uh, stuff because you could you had a big connection where if you came through, you came through Cincinnati on your way to Mississippi River, which goes down to the Gulf of Mexico, and there's and so it's really important in trade. We also had a big uh, steamboat construction uh, business going, and with an area called um, Fulton over in the uh, um, east side of town, was where they had these Fulton shipyards, and they built a lot of uh, major. Um, steamboats for the day. You see, this is what the public landing looked like. It was, um, you know, gravel and dirt, and you'd have to walk down that and then go down these planks to get on, onto the boats. And that was a public landing that they had to use for everybody. There was even an early fight where one of the early settlers tried to take that land for himself and filed a separate uh, plan for the city. And Israel Ludlow had already planned this to be a, a platform for or a, a landing that was for all of the public, the public landing. Um, and they actually had to go to court to um, determine whether that would be. And that came into play <laughs> um, later, much later, and I'm really skipping ahead. But in uh, late 60s, 1960s, um, the city decided that they wanted to build a baseball stadium called Riverfront Stadium. And that was a really good spot for it, but that was the public land. And uh, they actually had some people sued and they made them, the city actually keep a public landing, but they moved it a block east from where the original public landing was. So um, the original public landing is now where essentially it's not now because it's not the ballpark there anymore, but that's where they built Riverfront Stadium. And the current public landing is a block over. <clears throat> 
So the uh, importance of Cincinnati really grew as one of the major cities in the country, but it was the biggest in the West, you know, which, is, which is, at that time was the West of the Alleghenies. And one of the early figures in Cincinnati that uh, was important was Nicholas Longworth. And he's not like the most important person, but he has these interesting connections. You know the name Nicholas Longworth. In fact, it's rather confusing because there's three different Nicholas Longworths. Um, but Nicholas Longworth II is not his son, but it's actually his grandson. And you know, so it's it gets kind of complicated. Um, but Nicholas Longworth was had a lot of real estate and was a lawyer and um, was one of the first, the first millionaire in Cincinnati. And he bought a lot of land. Most of what is Mount Adams was his land. And, uh, but what he was most famous for outside of Cincinnati in the world was his vineyards. Um, he started, which is essentially the first American um, wine making business. And he had this sparkling Catawba wine using these Catawba grapes. And, you know, America was not known for wines. So it was pretty, very much a French thing. And so it, um, it was quite a, a new idea to have new, you know, an American uh, wine. It's a sparkling wine. I'm not an expert in all of this stuff, but my understanding is that it was kind of like a champagne, but champagne is a specific thing. So that's what kind of gives you an idea what it was. And he used Mount Adams as his vineyards. So he got to be quite wealthy. He was a big patron of the arts. He supported, um, you know, people like Hiram Powers, who was a, a major sculptor out of Cincinnati. Um, he bought um, this house from a guy named Martin Baum, who was another city, early city, city leader. He had built a house in 1820. Nicholas Longworth goes in, buys it from him when he had run into money issues. He expanded it. And that house is still around today as the Taft Museum of Art. So the Baum, Longworth, Sinton, Taft house. <laughs> Um, had all these different people. And so one of the other pe people that Longworth had brought in was um, a African-American artist named uh, Robert Dun S. Duncanson in the 1840s. And he commissioned him to do these murals, landscape murals that, in the foyer entranceway of the house. And they're still there. They're one of the highlights of the Taft Museum. Um, beautiful pieces. <clears throat> uh, so, you know, that was another one of his connections. He was really kind of an eccentric guy who... Um, there's a famous story where one day a young lawyer named Abraham Lincoln came to visit and he uh, heard about Longworth and wanted to go talk to him. So he finds this guy in the garden and asked if he could see the master of the house. And the guy brings him in, starts showing him the house. And it takes him about 10 minutes for Lincoln to realize that this was Longworth, that he was this eccentric guy who was puttering around in his own garden, but he was the millionaire you know, in Cincinnati. Longworth, of course, uh, like I said, there were more Longworths. His son, Joseph, helped uh, pay for and construct the Cincinnati Art Museum. They gave a lot of land that is now Eden Park, Mount Adams, um, and all that kind of stuff is, is all Longworth land. Nicholas Longworth III, so the great-grandson of this one, was Speaker of the House and married the daughter of uh, Teddy Roosevelt. So, you know, there's a lot of that. And then his granddaughter was... Um, Mariah Longworth Nichols Storer, who founded Rookwood Pottery. And, you know, of course, not only was that was a major, one of the, if not the first uh, manufacturing company owned by a woman, um, and it's still a huge force in, in arts and business and stuff in, in Cincinnati history that um, kind of resounds. I'm going to move on to uh, a <laughs> less pleasant <laughs> picture, but uh, very much an important part of the city. So I'll talk a bit more about this later, but we had this canal system that actually connected Lake, Lake Erie with the Ohio River, and that allowed for a uh, connection from the Great Lakes, so up in New York, and all that could come down through Ohio to Cincinnati, to the Ohio River, to the Mississippi River, to the Great, uh, the uh, Gulf of Mexico. So you can see how Cincinnati was right in the middle of all of this transportation and manufacturing, which allowed Cincinnati to become a major meatpacking uh, leader. And so we had all these uh, pork plants and, and meatpacking plants. And this is an illustration by uh, Henry Farney, who was another famous Cincinnati artist. Uh, and it kind of shows the whole meatpacking process. Uh, we had a nickname that's not so nice. It's not Queen City. Uh, nice. Oh, speaking of Queen City, I'll, I'll go back to that in a second. But it was Porkopolis. And so that was kind of the buildup of, um, you know, the, the, the build up the the uh, the, the 
the stature of the city. And by the 1840s and 50s, we got all these immigrants coming in, especially from Germany, and the population is doubling. Um, the pork plants were a major part of that. Well, we use up all the different parts of it. That's not just meat, but there's byproducts like lard. And you had companies like Procter and Gamble and Emory that used the lard to do other things, soap, candles, oleochemicals, and things of that. So the Procter and Gamble, which is of course the major, major uh, company in Cincinnati now, started in 1837 when a candle maker and a soap maker went in business together using the byproducts of the Porkopolis. Um, essentially what had happened though is that as the railroads came and things uh, you, you could use, you could travel further with um, the meat packing, so you could actually have like cattle and 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 the livestock in big wide open prairie lands out further west, and then you could ship them in or ship them. You could transport them in by train into Chicago, and that's where Chicago became the meat packing plant instead of or uh, center instead of Porkopolis. Going back to a nicknames real quick, I'll just backtrack because it's fun. Um, Queen City. And the Queen City nickname goes back actually to 1819, was the first reference. Cincinnati had this idea of being this high culture city. Um, and it used to be also be known as the Athens of the West, and Athens being, you know, the center of democracy, and all that kind of stuff, and, and Greek history. And uh, so it kind of got known as the Queen of the West, or regal and, and higher up. And it was long, or, or it was it was uh, Longfellow, the poet, who wrote a poem called "Catawba Wine" about Nicholas Longworth's wine, where he called Cincinnati the Queen of the West. And while since we, that was in 1830 something, but in 1819 we were already the Queen City by putting it into a poem and everything that really cemented the nickname of the Queen City. Another side story to the Porkopolis. So then, a, uh, a an English woman named uh, sorry, the English woman named Frances Trollope came to Cincinnati with the idea of, oh, this is this great cultural city. And instead, she find found these kind of river town folk and uh, Porkopolis, and she was not too happy with some of this. And her idea of this. Trollope's Bazaar was a marketplace where you could have like a coffee house and an art gallery and, and all that stuff, which seems very modern, interesting uh, idea, artsy idea. But this is a town of, you know, pork, uh, uh, meatpacking plants and uh, river folk, um, stevedores and stuff like that. It just was, was this extravagant thing in an old river town and so it uh, wasn't very successful and she went home to england and wrote this book called domestic manners of the americans and she had scathing review of cincinnati and all the uncouth ways of the cincinnatians and she also described the graphically the uh, byproducts of the pork uh, slaughterhouses and you know the smell and things like that and it was uh, you know to be honest it was probably a pretty fair description of Cincinnati but it was not how Cincinnati viewed itself so this is more how Cincinnati viewed itself <laughs> um, the Burnett house was a uh, one of the first uh, modern hotels in American history it's built in 1850 <clears throat> excuse me this is about 3rd and Vine Street. The front of the building's 3rd and Vine going up. <clears throat> and it looks like some sort of state house or something. But it was, like I said, a modern hotel uh, where it had running water. It had rooms for like or 40 or 50 rooms. It was not a little tavern, um, <clears throat> uh, like a room above a tavern or something. And so all of the really big names uh, um, who came through Cincinnati stayed here. Um, Prince <clears throat> of Wales, the future King Ever the seventh was he um he stayed here oscar wilde stayed here uh jenny lind the opera singer uh stayed here and they uh she was so impressed with it and she was so famous for her day that they actually then named the room after her and it was the jenny lind suite abraham lincoln stayed here twice um in fact on, once on his birthday which is i believe tomorrow yes it is tomorrow um in 1861, on his way to his inauguration, um, Abraham Lincoln spent the night at the Burnett House. And then in uh, 1864, um, in the second floor corner parlor, uh, Generals Ulysses S. Grant and um, William Tecumseh Sherman, who had been traveling together, spent the night and they put out a bunch of maps and they smoked cigars and they worked out a plan to end the Civil War. 
And the basic plan was for Grant to go after Lee to Richmond and for Sherman to go in the South and kind of disrupt things. When Sherman got to the South, he adapted the plan to eventually be the march to the sea and burning of Atlanta and, and all of that. But the germ of that meeting, uh, you're all of that, that the plan to kind of end the war came from this meeting in the Burnett house. You know, with a lot of things in, in history, they all sound great, but do we have any proof? So there's a hotel in Louisville that claims that that's where they were coming up with these plans. So I did an article several years ago where I read through um, the newspapers of the day and it, there was, they were there on the day they said and all that kind of stuff. But eventually I found two things that I thought were very decisive. One was a book written by one of Sherman's men shortly after the war, uh, you know, a couple of years later. And he talked about them putting the maps out and smoking the cigars and all that stuff in the Burnett house and specifically mentioned it. And the second one was in the Enquirer in May of 1865. So we're talking about one month after the end of the Civil War. And Sherman, being an Ohio uh, native, was came to town and he was being celebrated at a, an event at the Burnett House. And the Enquirer actually traveled with him from the train station to, uh, to the Burnett House and quoted him as telling the crowd, right here in this room, Grant and I put down maps and figured out how to end the war. So we literally have Sherman setting the record straight. Uh, what was a modern hotel in the 1850s was not so modern by the 1920s. Um, and as the city center kind of moved up to 4th and 5th Street, 3rd Street was now kind of outside the city center. And uh, so they eventually tore it down. Um, they built an annex to the um, PNC building or the Central Trust building. And if you kind of look at it now, uh, eventually they had taken off the dome and moved the entrance over to Vine Street instead of um, on 3rd Street. But if you look at that building now, it looks remarkably like the same structure, same it's about same height, the way it's built, this kind of H shape with the bigger ends in the middle. And uh, they were renovating it for um, condos um, a few years ago. And they gave me a tour of it because um, it's a really historic spot. And it was still kind of neat to stand on the second floor. And it was a different building, but it's really the same space, if you will. And to think that this is where Grant was and Sherman and... It, Abraham Lincoln and all these people um, kind of breathing, living in that same spot. It's kind of corny maybe, but it was kind of neat. Um, that's a, it's one of those buildings that I really wish I could have seen in person. Um, Underground Railroad was big in here. So you had Kentucky was a, a slave state and Ohio was a free state, but they had this fugitive slave law where um, it was allowed for people to, hunters, literal hunters to go and cross over into uh, free territory to hunt um, fugitive slaves. Um, and so uh, there was the Underground Railroad had all sorts of um, helpers, um, what they call uh, conductors, who would help these these people who were fleeing from slavery. And this painting here is a depiction of one of the most famous or infamous uh, stories of Margaret Garner. And this is a picture of Margaret Garner, and she and her husband and family had escaped from a plantation in Kentucky and crossed into Cincinnati. And she got they got discovered by the the uh, the slave hunters, <clears throat> um, and she opted instead of letting her kids go back into slavery, she uh, opted instead to kill them. She, she killed one and it, not, not everyone died, but just that how horrific slavery was that that would be a choice that she would make. And so it was a big um, case because you had these two sides who were trying to use these abolitionists and slave owners are trying to use the case for their own means. And so it was trying to figure out, do you put her on trial for murder, in which case you're admitting that these slaves that she killed were people? Or is it she had destruction of property and that they aren't people? They aren't you know, uh, beings that need to be protected. Um, unfortunately, the, the case didn't quite go anywhere because the, uh, the, 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 her master, slave master, um, kind of took her down further into Kentucky until she died of a disease um, a couple of years. Not, not too long later, it was a year or two, um, and that case kind of disappeared. That was made into um, an opera, um, the Cincinnati Opera uh, commissioned, a few, I don't know, it was about 10 or 15 years ago now. Um, the, and then um, Tony Morrison did the book Beloved, inspired by the Margaret Garner. This is a painting by <clears throat> Thomas Satterwhite Noble, who was the first um, 
president of the Art Academy in Cincinnati, um, and this piece is actually owned by the uh, PNG um, company. And then these are a couple of the slave, um, what do you call it, the Underground Railroad uh, conductors. Um, and the guy on, on the, my, the far right is Levi Coffin. He was a famous conductor in Cincinnati. Um, it's hard to find <clears throat> painting or pictures of some of these people because it was a secret. Uh, they, we don't, a lot of the, what we don't know about exactly what happened because they couldn't didn't keep records because it was very dangerous. Um, there was um, John Parker um, and uh, Rankin, um, two others over in the east side, uh, New Richmond area that <clears throat> um, were very important um, conductors in that. John Parker in particular, because he himself was a, um, you know, was a, a black man who owned a foundry. So he owned a business and he would risk his life going across the river himself, not just helping people, but like once they crossed, but he actually went in and helped them cross the river. And at any point, if any of these people were caught, you know, they could be killed and um, he would hide them in, in secret compartments and houses and things like that. And then Levi Coffin was friends with um, Harriet Beecher Stowe and in Harriet Beecher Stowe in the 1830s um, lived her father, what Lyman Beecher was the um, uh, president of uh, Lane Seminary in Walnut Hills. And they lived at what is now the Harriet Beecher Stowe house over on, uh, it was it Gilbert and McMillan or no Gilbert and uh, William Harry Taft. Is that right? Um, and when she was living there, there was a, uh, a famous big lecture series at Lane Seminary um, and it was the, where the students actually were holding the first public debates about slavery and they were exposing, you know, people to, you know, exactly the ills. And they brought in a, another um, fellow who, uh, who was a student there who had been a, uh, a, a black man who had gotten away from his slavery and bought his freedom, went into school and everything. And he was kind of showing that what you've been hearing about, you know, inferiority of people is not true. And so those really changed her mind and the stories that she would hear from the other abolitionists, she eventually turned into Uncle Tom's Cabin, uh, published in 1852. And that was a major influence in the, the people's changing people's minds or, or opening their eyes. Maybe that's a better way of putting it to the ills of slavery. And um, it's a story that's probably not true, say an apocryphal story, but it's a, it, it does sum up pretty well about uh, reportedly when Abraham Lincoln met uh, Harriet Beecher Stowe, he said, so you're the little lady who started this great big war. Um, and there doesn't seem to be any actual proof that he said that, but it, it kind of illustrates the impact that this book had in, from her time in Cincinnati and the abolitionists. Siege of Cincinnati is another uh, interesting story, or Civil War um, era. So, you know, there were no battles in the Civil War in, in Cincinnati. But there could have been. In 1862, the Confederates were marching through the South, and they were pretty much taking these cities like Louisville and stuff, marching up with very little resistance, and they were heading towards Cincinnati. So they uh, had a general in, in charge of the area, and he declared martial law. His name was Lew Wallace, and Lew Wallace went on to uh, write a one of the biggest novels of the 19th century called Ben Hur, which would turn into the Charlton Heston movie. But it was a huge hit. This is much earlier when he was a general. So he declared martial law in Cincinnati, and the Confederates came up in Northern Kentucky in a siege. So Cincinnati needed to protect itself. So they they are called out to uh, well a couple of things. One, there was no bridge yet. If you see in this picture, there's no Roebling suspension bridge. Um, that wasn't finished until after the war. So they needed to find a way to get across, and pontoon bridges had been uh, taking months to come together. Well, they went to the city engineers and they said they said, well, we got an idea. Give us 48 hours and they tied together these barges and built a pontoon bridge in 48 hours and it was big enough to get all these troops to be able to cross over into northern kentucky and they set up these fortifications fort thomas uh fort mitchell that's it's where those names come from um but they needed to get men uh, to to support this so they uh, called out to everybody and said everybody every bodied person come and and protect and help fortify and protect the city. Well, 
early in the year, the African American population had come up and said, "We're ready to fight. We're ready to, to, to you know, this is our our fight as well." And they were literally told, in no uncertain terms, "This is not your war. Sit down. You're not going to help." So when they called for everybody to come up, the black folks were like, so "You don't mean us." Well. They, the, the other people decided to force them. And so they went to their, their homes and they, and they forced them out at like gunpoint, knife point, and they gathered um, all these black men together in, in kind of like a little camp. And uh, it was, you know, a horrible situation. And there was a local judge named Judge Dixon, and he saw this and was appalled by this. So he went to General Wallace and on their behalf, and Wallace put a stop to everything he said every, send everybody home and give them the dignity if they want to volunteer and the next day there were twice as many black men ready to volunteer than had been forced from their homes and so they set up what they called the black brigade they had their own brigade their own flag and everything and they put judge dixon in charge and they sent them over into northern kentucky to build the fortifications but they weren't going to give them any weapons so they're within like a mile of the enemy camp closer than anybody else and all they have is like shovels and picks to build the fortifications well the, the confederates looked at the city and they thought this was supposed to be an easy win just walk in and take the city like they'd been doing and they thought well they're actually prepared and we have better use of resources and so they diverted the troops to other places and so instead there the siege of cincinnati didn't become the battle of cincinnati uh, because of the preparation, in particular, the Black Brigade. And so uh, um, several of the members of the Black Brigade went on to fight in, in other regiments. Um, a guy named Powhatan Beatty actually won the uh, Medal of Honor for bravery. So a lot of, of brave men in there. And this is a monument down in Smale Park um, along the river of showing a one of the black brigade members presenting a ceremonial sword to judge dixon and along the, the river there there's all these little plaques and stuff that tell the whole story so if you ever get a chance go down there for a nice walk <laughs> when it's not snowing and uh, you can read more about the black brigade and um, a part of the cincinnati history that is really important but kind of gets overlooked a bit um so i mentioned the roebling suspension bridge um Built in 1866-67, it was kind of, they allowed uh, pedestrian traffic in December of 1866, but they opened it fully in 1867. Uh, if you're going to go on the bridge, go this weekend. Um, starting Monday, it's going to be closed for nine months while they do some renovations. So that's a, a call out there. Um, it was the uh, largest suspension bridge in the world at the time. Um, Roebling was kind of a pioneer in the suspension bridges he went on to have another project in brooklyn and uh, he started designing that and then got uh, injured and sick and died and his son took over the rest of the project and when his son got sick his wife helped with that and uh, um, it's a really fascinating story if you know i think there's some documentaries and stuff about it but it's um so we kind of think of the Roebling Suspension Bridge as kind of a precursor to the Brooklyn Bridge. That was a whole other animal with much harder conditions than here. But um, I don't know, we think of this as older brother, maybe, you know, of, of the other bridge. <clears throat> Underneath the bridge here, this picture was taken about 1900, um, is the Island Queen, which was the steamboat that you would take to get to Coney Island. Um, in fact, that was the easiest way to go. There's The roads and things were not so easy to get there. Um, and for some people, that was the highlight of the trip. Uh, there was, or of the whole visit to Coney Island, um, the way there and the way back. But uh, there were two different island queens. The first one uh, burned down in 1922, and they built another bigger one, and that unfortunately burned down in 1947, I think it was. Um, and you know that was kind of a sad day and in the ends of summer events in Cincinnati. Check my time here. Okay, uh, Fountain Square, 1871. We're actually at the 150th anniversary this year. Um, originally, it was, uh, I think I have the picture here. It was built in the, the fountain. So the square was an island or an esplanade in the middle of Fifth Street. So this is from Vine looking towards, looking east. Um, and it was the whole fountain was facing 
East. Now, the fountain was a gift from uh, Henry Probasco. He and his partner, uh, business partner named Tyler Davidson wanted to present a, a gift to the city, thanking them for the success of their business. And uh, Tyler Davidson died before they could get the fountain up. So that's why it's named Tyler Davidson Fountain. And they wanted to put something, uh, well, they give it to the city, and the city wanted to put it someplace interesting. So they, there was this Fifth Street Market that they really disliked. You think of Finley Market, they had Finley Market, Fifth Street, Sixth Street, Court Street, Pearl Street, all had these different street markets. But the Fifth Street one was particularly nasty, apparently. And they thought, great, we can get rid of that that and put this fountain in, this, in the park or right there. Well, the problem was that the land had been donated to the city with the express purpose of being a marketplace. And so the uh, the, the butchers and, and the people in the, the, the market sued and the, the courts decided, well, you know, in Europe, they have these island or not islands, they have these squares that are kind of marketplaces as well. So it's kind of the same thing. And in case they, anyone was going to change their mind, the city leaders went out in the middle of the night and in three hours, they tore down the 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 butcher, <clears throat> the Fifth Street Market, and started the, the fountain. But then if you see in this picture on the left of next to the streetcar, there's a little metal flower stand. And that flower stand was put on on the square and flowers were sold there one day a year just so it could be counted as a marketplace. <laughs> when they redid the, the, the square and everything in the 60s, they went to court and they finally got rid of that uh, stipulation that they needed to do that. Um, I don't think I have, yeah, I don't have it in here, but um, Fountain Square, of course, uh, next to it is the Maybelline Carew building on 5th and Vine Street. And in the 60s, by that point, that building had been broken up and was pretty unsightly. So they tore that down and they moved the fountain outside of the, the island onto that spot, that 5th and, and Vine Street spot. And that's why 5th Street has that little jog where it's a little bit different because it used to have the, the roads on either side of an island. Then they moved the fountain to face west so that the cars could drive up to it. Then about 2006 or so, um, when they re had to um, fix the fountain and the square and they added the, the parking garage and all that under there, they turned the fountain once again facing south. So uh, I don't you know if we do another renovation, it's going to be facing a building north and we're not even going to see the, the woman on it or something. I don't know. But um, this picture is kind of interesting because... Um, this big one where you can see all these buildings. Uh, only one of these buildings is still around, the Traction Building, which is the tallest one you see there. So when you see a comparison of the city, it's it, it's quite striking that uh, <laughs> how very different city. Courthouse Riot, <laughs> very appropriate um, these times, unfortunately. Um, in 1884, there was uh, um, a lot. This is the thing I liked about the uh, the the timeline is how you could compare different things that were going on. So in 1884, where they're building the art museum, they've just built music hall. Um, all of these cultural things are going on. We have, you know, people who used to be in Cincinnati, from Cincinnati were president. And then we have the, one of those violent courthouse or violent riots in American history. And what was happening was that there was a lot of violence going on and not a lot of accountability. And when this guy was murdered and the people that, that did it got off much lighter, it's more complicated than that, but just for time, um, the, the crowd, the, 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 the whole city got incensed by this. And they had editorials writing about, we got to do something about this. So there was this group of people who started at Music Hall and they marched to the courthouse to try to essentially lynch the guy from the jail, but he had already been moved. And so they had a little skirmish, if you will, um, at, at the jail, but that was being well protected. What wasn't protected was the courthouse next door. So the crowd, the, the mob went into the, to the courthouse and burned it. Uh, this picture, a little hard to see, but in between the pillars, you see, you can see stuff behind there. That's actually, it's been gutted by the fire already. This has actually been destroyed. All those court records, uh, they brought in the national guard who brought in a Gatling gun and they fired on the crowd sometimes. And over three days of rioting, there were more than 50 people killed. Um, and it was a uh, led to a lot of having to change, um, you know, how the police was done. Um, it led to Boss Cox coming in um, and he was the political machine um, and his corruption came in because it was filling the power vacuum from this time. The courthouse riot was a, it was a monumental event um, in our history. And unfortunately, all too familiar. Um, 
We don't have a whole lot of time, so I'm going to go through the last couple of things you hear. Uh, Nasty Corner, you see all of this, uh, all these saloons. At one point, Cincinnati had like 2,000 saloons. I mean, it, it, maybe it was 1,500, but it was a lot. I did the math once and found out that there was a saloon for every four adult males in Cincinnati. Um, and here, the wiener worst with each drink and stuff. This picture is actually taken where um, at Fifth and Vine Street. And J.T. Carew of the Carew, uh, um, Maybelline Carew department store, vowed to do something better to get rid of that nasty corner, as he called it. So he built the Carew building on that spot. They tore all that stuff down and built this really nice building. And then later, the Emery's came along and built something else, and they named it for the same Carew. So Carew Tower is named for the same J.T. Carew as the Maitland Carew apartment building. Uh, inclines are a lot of fun uh, in the 1870s. Basically, you had everybody in the cities living together in the middle in this basin. And you have all these ethnicities and races and um, cultures and stuff uh, and, you know, class, really. Um, coexisting in this same spot and uh, you have factories and porkopolis and all this stuff going on here that the air was was hard to breathe and all this stuff and people wanted to get out well the only people who could get out because of the basin and the hills were wealthy people who could afford their own you know carriages and things and, and because of the hills they couldn't get like a what they call an omnibus a horse pulled bus couldn't get up the hill and so um only rich people could move out to the and start suburbs. Well, the inclines were a solution that came from Pittsburgh, and it was uh, these funiculars, the two tracks, and they'd pull up a car, a car um, and it, as one goes up, the other one goes down, and you could put a streetcar on it. And so they had five different inclines, uh, Price Hill and Mount Adams and Mount Auburn and Fairview, and uh, I'm blanking on one of them, but, <laughs> and, and going quickly. So it started in 1874 was the first one, um, and it really changed the city because it allowed the rest of the population that weren't the wealthy people to afford to go up the hill and start building suburbs, Price Hill, Hyde Park, you know, all of that stuff. And it spread out and got out of that basin. <laughs> and uh, so that was a major innovation. Um, people liked the inclines. The most popular one was Mount Adams because um, you could go up to Mount Adams, go to the art museum, um, and then you can go through Eden Park. And that was also where you would take the streetcar line to the zoo. So it was a lovely little little ride and everything. But the streetcar companies that owned this, to them, it was just slowing down traffic. And then, you know, when you have a car where you can actually drive up the hill, you don't really need an incline anymore. And so it was kind of more of a novelty, but people liked it. Yet the streetcar companies would close them for repairs and then dismantle them and not tell anybody about it. The last one um, around was the Mount Adams one, which closed in 1948. Uh, quick on this. I mentioned the canal. The canal that came through was the Miami Erie Canal. It followed what we know as Central Parkway today. That's kind of why it's so wide and the path that it chose. It would have these uh, canal boats on it. They would be about 15 feet long and they would float in about four feet of water. And forget how many horsepower, they were one mule power. They had one mule who would walk on it. They called it a tow path. And they would tow the canal boat down the river about two miles an hour. And uh, every time there was an elevation change, they would have to go into a lock and adjust the water levels, and, and it would take about 45 minutes. Well, when they got down to about where Eggleston to the river, that was the path they would take, um, there were like 10 locks. So it was very, very time consuming. Eventually, they just had to cut these things off. Well, when railroads came, this great idea to go through an inland waterway through Ohio was just not needed anymore. Um, but they kept the canal for a long time, still for cargo and stuff, but no passengers, really. But it kind of became a rank, bad water. Um, they had a hospital near there, and they worried about disease and stuff. So they tried to find a new way to do something with it. And they said, well, let's build a central parkway. And the idea was a really nice street with a park in the middle. And instead, we got a little strip of grass. But that was the plan. And in Europe, they had all these parkways that had subways underneath. So they had the idea in the 18, 10s, 1910s of doing a, uh, a subway. But then World War I broke out, and when the war was over, everything had sky, prices had skyrocketed, but taxpayers were not interested in paying any more money. So they scaled things back. Then it started the construction in 1920, and this is the twin track going underneath Central Parkway. 
Problem was, as I mentioned politics before, and Boss Cox, and he had this corrupt politics where you basically, in order to get elected, you had to go through Boss Cox. And uh, when the progressives uh, started getting power and they had the charter movement, the charter rights, um, they, when they got in charge, they tried to get rid of all of the corruption in politics, and that meant any of those projects that Boss Cox's people were working on, that's out. So they ended up stopping work on the subway in about 1929 and never finished it. And they, it, it's about two and a half miles of tunnels built underneath it, never really been used. And I know we're almost done, so Crosley Field, baseball, pitchers and catchers, uh, um report next week, I believe. Crosley Field was built in 1912 as Redland Field over in uh, Western um, West End. Um, you know, we're talking about a stadium in West End now. Well, we had a stadium in the West End uh, for a long time. The base, baseball was there for many, many years. Um, it was in the 1970s when they built that riverfront stadium, as I mentioned, right on the river. And that was part of the whole Cincinnati master plan of moving development onto the river that we're still trying to realize uh, from 1948 to now. It's still kind of building up there. And so they sent the, uh, uh, the Crosley Field was torn down. Unfortunately, it was one of those parks that was up there with, you know, Finley or, uh, uh, Fen Fenway and Wrigley Field in that era, that 1910-12 era that uh, it was well-liked after the fact. No one was thinking about it too much in 1970, Now, you know, 10 years later, and everyone kind of wished they still had Crosby Field. So as I said, you could only get through so much in an hour. So I'm just showing you some of the highlights that this book covers um, everything from politics to pop culture to sports. So we got... Uh, Union Terminal, you've got the flood in 1937, you got uh, <clears throat> James Brown and King Records, very, very important here, um, there's all those great murals, Ruth Lyons and uh, Pioneer Radio and Television, in fact, WLW and uh, Powell Crosley and the Crosley Radios and stuff, uh, that's all 100 years ago, 100 years ago, Powell Crosley started a radio company making these cheaper or inexpensive, uh, not cheap, but affordable radios and then said we need better programming so we started wlw and that got all these stars like doris day and rosemary Clooney and stuff all came from it uh you got the cincinnati royals oscar robertson you got the beatles came to uh, crosley field and cincinnati gardens you got the uh unrest racial unrest it if you look at it it's not just the 1960s it's the 1840s and the 1820s and all of that, the, the roots go very, very deep. Uh, Kings Island and the the Beast, Big Red Machine. Uh, we just lost uh, Joe Morgan a little while ago. Beverly Hill Supper Club fire, uh, Northern Kentucky. It's just as much part of Cincinnati. Uh, the Bengals um, at the Freezer Bowl. It's going to their first Super Bowl. And Fiona. We can't forget Fiona. This is the things that we're going to be talking about 50 years from now. We're going to say, remember all that great stuff about Fiona. So I think that's all I have at the moment. Uh, I know we're close to the end of time, but I want to see if we had any questions or anything. Um, let's see. I guess I'll do a stop share and then get to the chat or anything. Ah, well, nothing in the chat. <laughs> So if anybody has any questions and they want to unmute, um, I'll be happy to. Um, oh, I should say real quick while you're thinking of questions. Um, so, you know, it's hard in the pandemic <laughs> to have book signings and all that stuff anymore. Um, you can reach, you can find books at most of the local bookstores, Joseph Beth and the bookshelf and Roebling Point. Um, I, you, I have stuff on the website if you're interested in getting an autograph copy, things like that. And of course, the public library is an excellent resource. Um, that's how I write these things. I get all these books from the, from the library for research. So uh, I see at least one hand up. Um, so I don't know, Melissa McCann, I see. Is that, do you have a question? Let's see if you're, you're muted. So I don't know if that's. Oh, I'm so sorry. Yeah, my question <laughs> is um, the photos that you used, um, are they in the library or, or where are they archived? Uh, various places. Um, a big chunk of them are the Inquirer Library. I mean, that's kind of oh. the, it, as the librarian, that was a you know benefit that I have um, to be able to especially the, the the key to these things is what it's not just finding pictures it's pictures that you can legally use 
you have to get the permission. And so I got permission from the Enquirer, um, and that really helps with the last 50 years when you're trying to find, you know, pictures of the Reds and, you know, Evil Knievel jumping <laughs> greyhounds and, and stuff like that that you wouldn't just normally find elsewhere. Um, but the older stuff, there's a lot. Um, the Public Library has a lot of good photos. The Library of Congress, um, in particular, there was this uh, company called the Detroit Publishing Company that they took these photos all around the country that they would turn into postcards. You see those old hand painted postcards. And most of those photos are, you know, high res photos are available through uh, loc.gov. Um, and that's where that Burbling Bridge uh, was an example and some of those Fountain Square ones. Um, and then the Historical Society. The only problem with the, uh, which is now what the city, Cincinnati Archives and Library, um, with the pandemic and the construction on Union Terminal for a couple of years, it was hard to get to them. But um, they also have a wealth of, of photos. All right, thanks. But, um, and then the Inquirer ones, unfortunately, aren't as public. I mean, I, you can see them in the book. You can see them online through the Inquirer, but, you know, like if you want to use them. But that's why I try to use, especially the older ones. If I can find public domain photos, you know, that's always a, a great resource. Uh, Kelly? I see Hi. You. Hi. Yeah, I, I just, I'm unmuted. Okay. <clears throat> I don't have a question I because I know the time is short, but... Um, I just, it was such a great presentation. I thank you very much. I didn't grow up in Cincinnati, so I didn't grow up learning all the history. I've just gotten bits and pieces. And I was especially impressed with how you researched um, the Stonewall Jack, or not Stonewall Jackson, um, Sherman and um, uh, Grant story about how they met and decided on the March to the Sea and all of that. So excellent research. <laughs> That's all. I was just commenting. Are, are we all frozen? Yeah, I wonder. Yeah, Jeff, are you frozen? Does anybody else have any questions? I don't have any questions, but I just wanted to say thanks for organizing this and yeah. it's been so fun. I know we can't really get together in this time, but I've been really enjoying these events. Okay. Thank you so much. You, you recorded the session. Would they be available to other people? Uh, we're gonna try. I had a I had a little bit of a flub on my recording, so it started maybe a couple minutes too late. So we'll see if we can still get the rest of it posted. <laughs> okay. Yeah, that was great. Yeah. Thanks a lot, Lisa. Yeah, thanks. I'm glad you all could make it tonight. Okay. All right. All right, I guess maybe our speaker had a computer issue or something. So yeah, really <laughs> <laughs> we're at, at time anyway. So I'm glad you all can make it. Thanks for coming. Thanks very much. Hopefully we'll see you again soon. Thank you. Have a good night, everybody. Good night. Thank you. Thank you very much. Hey, you're back. Yeah, sorry about that. I lost the internet. Oh no. Well, we kind of we kind of <laughs> wrapped up. <laughs> uh, but you had a lot of a lot of good comments that came in. Just it looks like just to me, to the host. Um, 
Okay. Well, if there's Three. any way that I can, uh, you can forward things to me, yeah. I'd be happy to, to answer some questions or, and just kind of let that to everybody if they're recording, um, you know, always reach out to me. You can reach my website at jeffseast.com. You can send e emails to me. And um, I just appreciate everybody coming out and listening. And um, thank you very much. Yeah, we had one person who wanted to come. You have you come back for part two or even part three. Sure, yeah, that's right. <laughs> I got the 20th century and then the 21st century. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I could change Any my any final questions? We've got like four people left. <laughs> I did see one question that was started as I was trying to read something about there's anything that I didn't know ahead of time. And there's a lot of stuff I didn't know, but you know, I, I researching and writing articles for the Enquirer, that was kind of my background for everything is, you know, I find something of interest and, um, but then you, when you go and explore these these little articles, it's then you kind of put everything together. Um, so by the time I put the book together, I kind of knew everything because <laughs> that's what I've been. But it's from years of that's what I was doing, kind of doing the little research for this stuff. I think there's another hand. Yeah. Like, MT, if, if you're muted, but the MTE. M Tenover. Yeah. An iCloud. Yeah, that. If you have a question, you're muted, but. Um... There we go. Yeah. All right. Now? Okay. Yeah, I agree. Okay. I'm just wondering, um, Jeff, if there's any pieces of the Powder Magazine building left in a museum or something from Fort Washington? You know, I do not recall. If they said that there was anything, this is you know like 1950s. It was um, it was a parking garage over by uh, Western Southern um, right. offices, and I don't. I mean, if, if anybody has it, it would have to be the uh, historical museum, history museum, because um, they've got some. Um, yeah, well, I mean the uh, the Cincinnati one. You know, they have oh. a, the, uh, the the Cincinnati History Museum and Union Terminal. They have yeah. this great annex um, over on Lynn Street, I think it is, um, and it's the one where it has the mammoths out front. It used to be the old Natural History Museum oh. mammoths. Yes, and it you can get tours and stuff there, but they have artifacts. They have things like Samuel Hannaford's desk and the shoe of the first settler born in Cincinnati and you know I mean it's it's just an amazing you know uh William Lytle's uniform and sword and stuff like that so if anybody oh. had it it would have to be them <laughs> that's great so if we call the museum center and asked about getting a tour of the Lynn Street yeah. and and I have no idea what things are like now with the pandemic you know it might be one of those things that you you know put on your list of things <laughs> once <laughs> sure I got a big list believe me yeah <laughs> Um, but I think it's private tours or small tours, you know, like 10 people or something, you know, but um, I would reach out to them at some point and see if there's. Okay. Thank you very much. I appreciate yeah. it. Excellent yeah. job. Oh, thank you. <laughs> I used to teach uh, fourth grade social studies, mm -hmm. which included um, history of uh, Ohio history. So I would spend some time on, especially the early part of Cincinnati. Mm -hmm. And um, so you, uh, I, I was gratified to hear that I didn't teach my children incorrect information. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's 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 my wa daughter is doing right now because she's work she's doing school from home, and so I'm hearing these these things, and she's asking a question, and I'm like, oh, you know, the Adina, <laughs> you know, it's. <laughs> she's a fourth grader, huh? Yeah, she's a fourth grader. Okay, At great. One for Heights Elementary School for those. Oh, okay. <laughs> great. All right. Well, or, or my <laughs> living room, depending on how you. <laughs> how you yeah. Do, how you do it. <laughs> All right. Thanks a lot, Jeff. Take care. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right. We've got a couple people left. Anything else? Any final questions? Comments? Well, as I said, you can always reach out to me uh, through the website. Um, like I said, the email, there's a, you know, email to me kind of thing. And uh, I'd be happy to answer anything. And hopefully, hopefully, um, when I do part two, it will be in person <laughs> with, uh, you know, everyone sitting around. Yeah. Probably be a little easier on you having a live audience, huh? Well, I don't lose the internet. <laughs> 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 All right. Well, good night, everybody. Good night. Thank coming. you.